right. Uh, we'll welcome those that are here in person and those that are joining on Zoom. I see some uh, Zoomers are, are still Zoomers that, that <laughs> works, uh, are still coming in here to the meeting. And thank you again for joining us for our first hybrid HR Council meeting of the new after summer, uh, I guess, little break that we had. So very happy to see some faces uh, in, in, in place here and uh, also on Zoom. Um, very happy to have uh, Jay Miller. He's the, uh, the co-owner of DRM Productions uh, and Retriever Digital Signage here to talk about uh, communication lead retention. And the idea is we will discuss the impact that clear communication has on building and retaining trust with your team, taking a look at how companies are using traditional and technical communication methods to get company values, goals, and policies across their teams in an ever-changing workplace. Very happy to have Jay uh, here. It, this will be a second uh, presentation this, this month. We had it for Manufacturers Council as well. But, oh, I did have one uh, quick, quick announcement, a reminder that our annual regional business expo is October 28th uh, out at All Occasions Catering in Waldo. Uh, and that's both Delaware and Marion Chamber uh, coming together. Should be a really fun night. Free food, free wine, mm -hmm. beer. Uh, don't want to miss that. And a great opportunity to network with some folks. Uh, now I'll hand it over to Jay. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I um, appreciate you being here. It's good to be back. I'm glad there's, there's people here. It's always a lot more fun to see faces and get some interaction. Um, I'm going to give you a quick history on kind of me and the company. So I'm Jay Miller with DRM Productions. Uh, DRM has been in business since 1983. They started out doing video production for cable ad insertion. So um, when cable ad, when cable television first came to town, you could put your own ad in and they, DRM started out doing uh, video commercials then. Uh, we've grown. So from there, we started doing interactive presentations um started to get into web design and then that's about the time that i came on so it was very heavy media production and then i had a background in software design um so that was probably 2005 and then we took on um, web design software design we do 3d modeling and animation we do interactive kiosks um and then we also created a product called retriever digital signage that's kind of software that goes a player goes behind your TV and we wrote a really easy interface for getting content to it. So I like to consider DRM a communications company. We meet with clients. We try and figure out who you're communicating with, what you're trying to get across, and then how can we utilize our artistic skills and technical ability to help you get that message across. Um, a lot of our staff um, come from arts backgrounds, uh, Pittsburgh Art Institute, so we've got animators, graphic designers, it's a really creative group. Um, my background, so what got me into technology was, uh, here, I've got, sorry, I'll go outside with you. Oh, can you switch me? Yep. Mansfield, yep. Um, so there's DRM, founded in three. We grew into kind of multimedia design, like flash development, things like that through the 90s. Um, web and software development. So at the Manufacturer Council, I talked a little bit about, um, we've done a lot with software optimization for processes in manufacturing, um, where one of my clients had their quality control system was a piece of plywood with baseball counters on it. And you would sit there and press the counters. It said like chip, bubble, um, and write all that down at the end of your shift and then you'd write it on a whiteboard. And then your manager would come over and write all the numbers down and then type them into a spreadsheet. And then somebody else took that spreadsheet and put it into the ERP system. Well, we wrote a touchscreen application that ties right into the ERP system. So as they're doing it, it's going right in. Um, so that's kind of what we do on software development. And then future thinking, um, we've been messing with virtual reality, um, augmented reality, and then again, digital signage. So we've got some clients that do training and through last year, we're unable to get their maintenance techs on site to do any repair. So we created a VR app where they can send a headset to the maintenance techs and they're standing in front of the machine and they literally reach down and pick up a screwdriver and learn how to replace assembly parts on the machine. So like I said, it's constantly changing. Um, we relearn our jobs all the time, but that's the fun of it. I don't sit down very long and I, I love moving and learning new things. So, um, 
my background, so again, get back to this. Uh, my grandpa's influence. I had one grandfather who was a ham radio operator. Um, so I would sit on his lap and we'd spin the dial and I would talk to people all over the world as a kid. Um, so at a really young age, I realized the world was a lot smaller than we thought because I could sit in grandpa's house and talk to who knows. I don't even know what some of the languages were, but it's cool as a kid to go, what is that noise? Um, my other grandpa was a tap and repairman for 40 years. So I went from an electrical engineering ham radio operator to a mechanical engineering appliance repairman. And between the two of them, I can tear just about anything apart. <laughs> Um, back together is always the challenge. Um, so then I uh, went to work for a dial-up internet company in the 90s. I started on phone support. Uh, they offered me an opportunity to start writing software. They said, if you can learn to write software for this client, we'll get you off the phones. So I went to Barnes & Noble and bought a couple books and spent the next 20-ish years writing software. Um, I went to college twice. I made it almost through my first year both times. Um, now I'm co-owner of DRM um, as of about 2010, so that's been exciting, um, helping lead and decide the direction that we had. Um, we've got a team of about 15 of us now. When I started, there were four of us in 2005, and we've grown to be about 15 now, so it's exciting. Um, our last company Christmas party, and this is how I judge the wellness and size of our company, is we were down at Dave and Buster's and there were 35 kids sitting there and I looked and went, oh my gosh, every one of them depends on me to make the right decisions to have a good Christmas. Um, so that's how I look at um, um, So again, your guys' world. Um, we do, again, in web development and marketing and, and that creative, I sit in a lot of different organizations and I hear problems and I see things that work. Um, so that's kind of what this is. What's the problem? Finding and retaining employees with the right skills to meet production demands and continued growth. I don't think I can go, or I know I can go into any business and say, hey, are you having hiring issues? And they're going to say, yes. How do we continue to grow? Um, it's just everyone is having. We were talking before this meeting, um, even when we were in the food. So it's across the board. Now. Everybody's having people problems. Uh, the question is, how do we start to make an impact here? Um, so what is the problem? Uh, people skills, that's one of them. Uh, that's where we were just talking on the way in here. Soft skills. Do people have the soft skills that you need to just show up every day? Um, desire and drive. Uh, I hear a lot of times people show up, they show up for a week, they're gone the next week, they, they don't care, they, one way or another, um, soft skills, that's what we're talking. We were talking about customer service, caring about what the end product gets to the customer, or even if they interact with a customer, caring that the company uh, reputation is carried across successfully. Um, and then a big one is the ability to learn. Uh, a lot of people are scared to learn new things or to grow even within an organization. So sometimes you get people into your organization that are great, uh, but as an organization grows, they don't grow with it. Um, so that's a struggle on the people side that um, we're running into. Um, so beyond people problems, so even when you get good people, so hiring is the next issue that I'm seeing. Everybody. So they either have people and they're having people problems or they're having a hiring issue. Um, how many people in the room are actively hiring? Or looking for people? Yeah. Um, I drove by like four billboards on my way over from Mansfield that all say, we're hiring, we're hiring, we're hiring. Um, so the hiring issue, yeah, right? The hiring issue comes down to things like finding people. Uh, where can we find them? Do they have the skills then when we do find them to fill the jobs that we need? And if not, can we at least train them to do what we need? Can we get them in here and can we run them through training? So people are just hiring, 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 hiring. I talked to someone recently, and this was surprising. He had hired 100 people this year, and he's only up six positions. So I hear this a lot, too. We've hired 140 people this year, and we're up 10. It's only filling 10 positions. So I look at it as a boat that has a whole bunch of holes in it, and people are bailing with milk jugs. And so then when they bring on someone, hey, we're, we're sinking, we need more people, let's bring someone on. They just kind of take the one milk jug and give you two quart jugs. And now two of you are bailing the same boat. 
with the same milk jug. So you're not, you're thinking differently. Um, so that's what I'm seeing is that even when they're bringing on employment specialists or hiring specialists, you can't out hire the holes that are happening. Um, when you lose a hundred people in a year and only gain six, you can't hire your way out of that. It's just not feasible. Um, and so that's where I'm at with seeing hiring billboards, hiring. Yes, you need to, uh, but then that comes down to the next piece of this, which is retention. Um, if you start retaining more, you don't have to hire as many. So if we, rather than just keep pouring more water in the top, and as it's spraying out holes in the funnel on the side, and we say, well, just dump more water in the top. Well, there's bigger holes. Well, then dump more water in the, it's not doing any good. We need to start filling some of these holes so that the water stays in the funnel and spins the fly. Um, so some of the issues that I see in retention, um, pay, a, a great, um, I'll go into the analogy there. Um, so a lot of people, uh, and we're talking uh, even in food service, competitive pay is hard. Um, an analogy I like to use, I mean, this goes into where we'll lead with retention. This is an analogy I like to use. Um, so you bring 10, 15 people through a session of training. And at the end of that training, you look at them and you go, all right, number one, you're on line one. Number two, you're on line seven. Number three, you're on line eight. Number four, you're on line nine. They sit there and they run parts all day. And they get home and their spouse says, hey, how was your first day at the new job? Well, it's not first day because they've been through three to five weeks of training. But first job on, first day on the job. And it was all right. I ran my parts. I don't know what it is. It's some little metal thing. And I stick it in and I make it all day. Well, that guy gets a call that night from another place he applied and it's 15 cents more an hour. He goes, oh, awesome. Hey, honey, I just got a 15 cent an hour raise. Well, that employer just spent three weeks training you, got you ready, and then you walk out for 15 cents. Uh, so here's scenario number two. Is you bring people through, 10 people through for training. And on their third or fourth day in the break room up on the TV, they start to see, hey, I'm Jay Miller. I like hiking, basketball, and fishing. I've got two kids. They go to Lexington. And somebody comes up to invites me to basketball on Tuesday night. Hey, Jay, I saw a new guy, right? Hey, we got basketball league Tuesday nights. Are you in? So I start going a week of basketball league. And my wife says, hey, how's the new job? Oh, my gosh, I love it. This guy's a point guard. I play on the team. He's not, that person's not leaving because he's now a part of something. So that's kind of where we're going to talk about today is how do you start to build that camaraderie and that team to where it's not about pay. Um, it's not, the other big thing I have here is conflict. Um, so when you get conflict going on, uh, that will drive to leaving. People will quit before they'll tell you there's a problem. Uh, so if you can start to address how to fix it. Start to address conflict ahead of time. Uh, you can de-escalate some of this. So again, uh, it's about clear communication. So conflict is another big issue. So the analogy I like to use there is uh, there's a safety meeting and you talk about eyewear has to be worn on the production floor at all times. Um, it's clear. You guys had a meeting. It was clearly discussed. Next day, three or four people that weren't at that meeting show up and they look around and most of the people have the safety wear on, but that guy doesn't. So I'm going to ask him, hey, why is everybody suddenly wearing safety glasses? And he's going to say, well, you know, they have one of those meetings they have every quarter and they tell us we need to do the safety stuff, but I'm not doing it because this is how it goes. So the people are going to follow the path of least resistance. Whereas if you clearly communicate and then reinforce it with either paper signs, whiteboards, even digital is the way to go anymore if you're using PowerPoint or a USB stick. Um, but if there's a sign up on the production floor that says eyewear must be worn here, I, I know some of this seems silly, um, but I go into places that go, oh, well, we never thought of putting and then it reduces conflict because you've got an issue of, well, people aren't listening to us. And now we got hit with OSHA again. And every time we have the safety meeting, we've had 
18 safety meetings this year. You don't realize that Mark hasn't put his on once all year. And everybody that shows up goes and asks Mark, and that's where that conflict, because now you've got the people that are following the rules that, hey, we keep getting yelled at because you five aren't, and you deal with tension, and you'll lose good people before you'll lose the bad people. Um, the ones that aren't listening are having, they're not upset, so they're good. It's the ones that are continuing getting yelled at for doing the right things, because it's hard once you get to be a certain size to individualize that. Um, where your good people will leave over conflict that was addressable and fixable. Um, and then the third thing of, of retention is future. People want to feel like they have a future. Well, how can I grow here? Or how can you help me grow? Um, there's a lot of entry level people. Um, I look at my great grandpa worked at Westinghouse his whole life. And I think he worked on the same machine his whole life because at the end, when he started to pass, he was asking if the presses were still running. And so a lot of people want to know that there's more opportunity than that. I don't want to spend the 30, 40 years making the same. I don't even know what I made for 30 years, but I sat there and did it. So make sure you're showing opportunity for growth, hiring from within. Um, when you talk about you built a great person, um, keep them within your organization. How do you do that? You show them a path to success. Um, I talk to a lot of places that are like, we've got 18 open positions inside the company that aren't getting filled. So then I start asking, okay, well, that's why don't people inside either a, why are internal people applying for those positions? They either don't want them or there's something going on with those positions that there's bad mojo within the company, or they just don't know that those positions are available or that that's the next step to the next step to the next step in leadership. So it's, it's a lot of times just, again, Communication, uh, it's assumed communication, it's lack of communication or it's wrong communication. Um, so I was in a meeting uh, recently and talked about um, how do we start to appreciate people? Um, and he, hey, here's something that we've done. And it was, so we've got a company newsletter and we wanted to highlight an employee each month in the company newsletter. And we started asking people, hey, we'd like to highlight you in the newsletter. And people were saying no. And it was just shocking that people wouldn't want to be recognized and appreciated in the company newsletter. Um, so that I had to think about that one for a while. The result was that the state, there's, again, why aren't people, is that there's an issue around people don't want to, they would rather keep their reputation with their friends and coworkers then tie that reputation to the company. Uh, if I'm in the newsletter, now I'm the teacher's pet and I'm probably gonna tell that we all go back, all back and smoke 15 minutes early between breaks, right? I mean, that's literally where it's at is, oh, oh shoot, hey, uh, careful around Mark. And then Mark gets black sheep and then he's gonna quit. It might've been a great employee. So, it, that was an interesting, hey, we're trying to recognize them, but not thinking of it from the employee shoes of now I'm in the awkward position. I really don't want to put my name on the company. I've only been here a month. I really don't know if I'm, I got another job offer last week. Um, so it's thinking of ways to recognize them that are meaningful to them, not, well, we let them be in our newsletter. Isn't that enough recognition? Um, so it's a, it's a lot of just sitting down asking hard questions of why are you losing people? Where are they going? Um, how can we, again, communicate company goals, opportunities? A neat one I see, and like I've said a couple of times, is most people don't know what they're making. Um, I've got some clients that put either posters or up on TVs, they'll put the finished product that they make because then people are proud of what they're doing. Um, one of my clients makes plastic film. And so when you go to the grocery store, you go, oh, see the paper towels? I make all the film that that's wrapped in. Or you say, hey, see that? Uh, my dad makes uh, the airport the, or the airline galleys. So the little serving card that comes up and down and bangs you in the knees. So every time I fly, I always look to see if my dad's tags on it um, because I know what, again, finished product, that's what you're building. So you start to take pride when you can go out in public and show people, hey, I make that. Hey, see those padlocks on the back of that truck? Those are us. Um, versus, I don't know, I make this, I cut the end off this little spring for eight hours a day. Um, so that's, again, and it's communicating 
what do you make? Or customer feedback, positive and negative. Um, what, what, I sit here and you yell at me when I do stuff wrong, but I don't understand that it goes into another piece and it goes into an automotive or maybe a car and the impact that safety has on me just going, does it really matter if I don't cut it exactly right? Well, yes, it does. Um, or wins too. Hey, look, we just, remember last week when we all went triple overtime? That was to save this customer's butt and they were very appreciative. Thank you all. And they thanked us. Um, so things like that. Sometimes that feedback gets filtered before you get to the level of the people that are really going to appreciate it. Um, and again, educational opportunities. How can I grow? Um, that's probably the biggest thing that I see right now is that, uh, especially with college education might not be the, the choice for everybody anymore. Again, like I said, I dropped out of college twice, but I have continued to learn throughout the years. So how can you provide me educational opportunities that I either might have missed out on or just didn't know were available or specialized training now that are more of a benefit to your organization? Um, so that's a big one there, especially with um, Ohio has the, uh, I forget what the program is called. The, 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 the capstone pathway? Yes, where you get like a $2,500 grant towards continuing education. Oh, tech fed. Oh, yeah, tech fed. Yes. Um, but there, again, there's lots of different programs where it, it can help offset that cost from the employer. But again, if you're helping people grow and learn, they're not going to, why do you leave? Because they were teaching me too much. <laughs> people don't, because they provided me too much opportunity, right? That just doesn't happen. So, uh, and it's, it's a changing world. We're coming from the, aren't you glad you have a job? Um, the analogy I would like to use is you have the don't talk about it generation managing the let's hug it out generation, right? And that's conflict. So how do those two start to talk or communicate? Because it doesn't always have to be talking, right? Um, again, We've created a digital science product. We use that because anyone under 40 was raised on a television. If you put it on a television, we'll do it. <laughs> um, so why aren't employers that are saying, I can't figure out how to get any of these people to listen. Young kids these days don't listen. No, they don't listen to people screaming at them anymore. What they do listen to is anything a television tells them. So if you can subliminally <laughs> get it across to a television, um, it also helps de-escalate the manager as the bad guy. And it's like, hey, didn't you see what the latest safety update is? It's not, hey, I'm telling you, you need to. Why aren't people listening? It, it, it's a completely confused piece. So again, sometimes it's through company internets, uh, text messaging, traditional signage, whiteboards. I, I really tell people there's not a right or wrong. It's where are people at? What are they seeing? What can you get in front of them? Um, is it working? Is it not working? Um, just start communicating. Uh, most places I go into ends up, oh, we just didn't realize that we weren't saying anything. So trying something is, is really one of the first steps. Is anybody doing something along these lines? Okay. We actually just bought a test. Okay. We'll start digital. Cool. Yeah. So, yep. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yep. Um, so then the next piece is going to be personal recognition. Um, and that's where you start to build them as part of the team, part of the organization. How do we build camaraderie? Um, I just celebrated one of my employees 25th anniversary. And he's my age, right? So he came straight out of college and was working there. But it's about him celebrating wins, providing educational opportunities, um, seeing what the finished product is that they go into and having pride with that. And there's no reason to leave. He's continued to learn, had a, a plenty of opportunity, and then enjoys hearing the feedback from the customers. And I know it, when, you, when you get into manufacturing, this is all a lot hard to pull off. Um, the big thing as well in communication that I see in more of the industrial manufacturing workforce, and this is an aha moment that I see in a lot of places, is when paychecks went direct deposit, most employers lost the only means of communication they have with their workforce. It's a workforce that doesn't have 
cell phones. They don't have email. There's, they're not in the offices to chat a lot. Um, so when we start looking at how are you communicating, well, you used to stuff everything that you put into a paycheck and that's gone. What did you do instead? And they kind of go, hmm, we haven't really been doing anything. Um, so that's why we start to look at how do we fix it? A lot of times this has to be personnel driven. Um, it has to be passive because you've got, yeah, that's where we start looking at what's the traffic flow, where are people seeing the signage? Because it doesn't do you any good. When I start walking around a place with someone and we start looking at traffic flow and they say, well, everybody comes through this door. And then we go, well, wait, all your signs were back on that other wall in the other end of the plant. Does anybody go there? Well, no, but that's the closest wall to the HR department. So that's where it all goes. And you go, well, that's not doing you any good. So you are communicating, but it's not where you need it to be. So look at where people are flowing. How is, is anybody seeing it? Um, ask for feedback. They'll usually be fairly honest. Um, the other thing that I brought up on the personal recognition, um, on the example that I had with the newsletter where people didn't want to be recognized, is to find those initial cheerleaders or the ones that are all in and get them on board first. So that way it kind of defuses the fear of, ooh, I don't want to be the first one to get recognized because now I'm in the spotlight and now everybody's going to be looking at me and I really screw up on Thursdays, right? So things like that. But if you know there's people that are going to, don't force people into this, get the people that are going to appreciate, accept it and run with it and then use that to build the momentum ongoing. Then you can start to recognize other people. But a lot of people really are terrified of recognition only because of the spotlight it puts on them going forward. And I don't want to be watched. I just want to do my job and go home. Um, I have uh, one client that, again, just sitting down brainstorming. His issue was uh, people come in late all the time. They don't see the importance of this landscaper. So, well, it's sunny all day. What's the matter if I get here 15, 20 minutes late? But they don't realize that there's 10 guys on a crew and when you're 15 minutes late, nine other people are sitting there doing nothing. So he came up with a program where every day you're on time, you get a dart. And at the end of each week, you throw that many darts and that's how much of a bonus you get that week. He said, I haven't had anybody show up late yet. He wouldn't believe the dart team we had. <laughs> uh, so it's just something as simple as that of, coming up with an incentive to get there either early or on time. And it wasn't big for him, but it was big for the impact that it made on the organization that, that you don't have nine other people ready to quit because Steve shows up late every day. Um, but we need Steve because he's a key part of the team. So how do we fix this for everybody? Just kind of, like I said earlier, there's no right or wrong. There's what's working, what's working in your world. Um, and then can you make it work better? Um, the other thing I'll say to that, can you make it work better is that a lot of times if it's working, don't try and make it better. They, I go in a lot of places where something was working and they change it and then it fails from there. Um, so again, communication comes down to appreciation, understanding, and then provide them a clear future. I think if you can do those things, you're gonna see the holes in the funnel start to fill up you're not going to completely eliminate the need to hire, but you're not going to be hiring 100 people for six positions. So uh, that's, that's kind of where I was getting into. Again, the how gets into what works for you, um, where are people, what's the thing. And again, we've created a product called Retriever Digital Signage that the televisions just work. Um, we started the product probably 13, 14 years ago with a company that wanted to communicate to their employees in the break room. They had paper signs up and it wasn't working. So we helped them put TVs in. Uh, they were, we originally were reselling a product uh, that was horrible. It did not work well. It was old DOS command prompts that you had to use to run the software, like slash load image, and then a whole path. It was a nightmare. So that's where my background in software design came into play. I bet the owner of the company at the time that I could write something that worked better than what we were reselling. So a dollar later and a whole lot of Red Bull and pizza, and we had the first version of Retriever. So 
it's been a lot of customer feedback, what works, what doesn't. We're just launching version three of it. Um, so that's been exciting to help adapt that tool and solve a lot of these problems. Um, again, going back to my grandpa's, I'm a tinkerer and a problem solver. So I like to sit down, ask a whole lot of questions. I'm the why kid that just got taller. Not a whole lot heavier, but taller. <laughs> Um, and then figure out, is there a technical solution that I can help apply? Or can we just brainstorm our way through you fixing it up? Uh, any questions or feedback? Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I think that you know, the problem solving is really important. Um, and so what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, so we've done, and it really depends on everybody's world, where interactive kiosks, you can up to it. It's got company information. It's got HR information. It could have educational apply for our in company. Yep. Um, Let's just say applications for internet access. Yeah. Class or anything like that. Yep. 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 Because again, a lot, and that's what we run into. Sometimes I'm sitting down with people. They're going well our applicants may not have computers at home. So how do we deal with walk-in or things like that? So yeah, um, it's, and it's, again, it's where is your audience? What makes sense? Do they have time to stop at a kiosk and interact with it? Would be some little feedback on that. So yeah, we can do as much or little. Yeah, yep, yep. And um, we just did uh, Kingwood Center Gardens. Uh, we just did interactive kiosks for them when you walk into their new visitor center, tell you all about it and history and things like that. So, yep, if it's on a computer and it's techie, that's you're either doing it or figuring out how. <laughs> I just was going to comment. So, in my business, I'm working with probably a lot of the same types of folks you're working with, working with leadership teams, management teams, and HR companies, yep. or HR departments. And if one of the things that I constantly talk to them about is that they're in the marketing business, yeah. right? And so what I really love about what you're talking about is that I think sometimes, especially as HR folks, we shy away from the concept of marketing because yeah. it's, that's not us or it's salesy or whatever. But what I know from the work that I've done is that, you know, many times to get somebody to buy, you know, sort of the business world it might be a purchase here, it's adoption of an idea. Yep. It may take seven to 10 touches with somebody before they get it. Yeah. So a lot of times we send the email or we have the meeting and we think everybody's got it and it's on board. So the passive things that you're talking about, convoy reminders yep. and things, I think are a huge difference maker in terms of the organizations that get higher grades from who we're recognized or we're communicating with yep. and things of that nature, especially when we talk about the current labor market, but we're always in the marketing business of trying to keep our people right. here and we're, we're constantly recruiting as painful as that is as HR for us. Yeah. We're recruiting outside and we're recruiting inside too. So I yeah. really like some of the things you talk about and some of the examples you showed that help us do those things without having to take a lot of our own time. Right, that's, that's the biggest is. thing is that HR departments are spread so thin. I went in one place and they had TVs but in order to update it, the computer was above someone else's desk. So I had to ask them to leave their desk and crawl up on a chair and plug it. That's not right. So let's, let's fix this. Let's make it easier. Um, and that's where, and going back to our retriever, it's all template based because what we saw was HR departments didn't want to have to be graphic designers. Like, okay, I have to build all these pictures. Well, no, we already have graphic designers. You just type in the message you need. Um, yeah, based on a lot of the billboards I see. Was like, your, your comment also, or you would encourage, if you have these TVs, to keep the content fresh. And as oh, yeah. As yep. That, yeah. Like stats of like yep. Sports. Weather, news, trivia, things like that are great. Um, put two or three pieces of company information and then sports news and then two or three more in the weather. Um, what it does is it gets people watching the information they want and they absorb that extra content that you really want to get across. Um, and again, that once they see it two, three, four times, it really starts to sink in. This is all very, uh, obviously now very relevant. Attention is 
maybe it's it's lowest right now or so yeah, right. it's just been uh, it's been crazy I, the meeting i had this morning with um all the school districts in the area uh and the pandemic in terms of the the virtualness of education yeah as well kind of taught the folks that are you know the high schoolers and they can just kind of log off from it when it when it right. gets challenging or that or whatever whatever reason in school and that's apparently translated to the workforce too mm. so they can, they'll just walk away from things now or just literally chase uh like you said the uh the 10 cents more yeah right and there's no they, they didn't see it in, in school as a as a negative so they're not they're not seeing that there's not that mentality yeah. coming out so it's, it's it was bad and now it's kind of gotten worse yep. from, from this so uh that's a challenge that the uh the schools are not trying to reinforce that you can't you do that right. <laughs> uh you can't do that uh in the workforce yeah. uh so that's been an interesting thing to hear too oh yeah that's that side but anything you can do to so again help, help with that culture i think it's gonna it's, Story. Yeah, so reinforcing it, driving it, and, and answering the questions. And a lot of times it's just unknown. What is the company goal? A lot of times I go in and again, dealing with leadership, you probably see this a lot. All right, all six of you tell me what your company mission is or what's the goal of the company. You'll get six different answers or five I don't knows and the one that said it knew. So it's uh, a lot of times when I'm asking these questions, it's not at the workforce level that we're solving problems. It's going, ooh. We don't know the answers to that right now, but once we figure that out, which would be great to have, yeah, don't get your information. Um, we can help them communicate it. But if you don't know what it is, I can't help you communicate it. And so that's the conversation I have a lot of times is let's circle back here in three months and see if you're ready to start communicating. I think the power of visuals too, you know, so like I think back a lot of the workforce development work that I've done to try to show people a career path and options and opportunities. Yeah. That's hard to talk to. Yeah. But I can put it in a graphic and it, it's showing up regularly. Right. It's that reminder of well, why am I doing this today? What am I doing training wise? Where can I go? Two more positions from now and that's where I want to be. Right. It's it's they don't have a goal or they they just don't see the future. And again, some of this comes back to getting into the schools. We do a ton. We'll, I'll bring any school that calls me their students through or interns or anything I can do to get kids involved. Um, I raise my hand because that's how we solve the problems is teach kids. I mean, if somebody didn't teach them, then it's going to fall on me. I mean, I'd rather do it earlier than when I have them on the job because it costs me a lot less. <laughs> Anyone on, on Zoom have any, any comments? I look at the chat, I didn't see uh, anything there, but feel free to chime in now. That's all right if you don't. <laughs> well, again, uh, thank you to Jay for a great presentation. Thank you for those that are able to make it here in person and those that are watching uh, on Zoom and then those that are watching the recording afterwards. And um, We'll call it uh, for this month's meeting, and we will be back again in the hybrid uh, next month. And uh, more information will be going out soon on that. But thank you all very much, and have a great rest of your day. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Let's <laughs> a live clap. That's the first time I've heard it in yeah, exactly. 18 months. <laughs>